Tem gente que pode falar português aqui? No? One? Okay, good. Um, so, my name is Jason Gardner, and I'm a photographer. And um, this is about the production of the book, A Flower in the Mouth. So, it's about um, Brazil. It's one area in Brazil that I've been photographing over five visits in nine years in the northeast uh, area of Brazil called Pernambuco. It's a state. And as you can guess, I speak Portuguese now because not many people speak English there. So it was a little tricky learning as I went, but um, very interesting as well. I thought I would do my presentation with three areas. One, the bulk of the presentation is about the book, about the images, about how I produce them and what they are and what they mean and all the context of the book. Uh, but then I'd also go deeper into the actual book production issues of going on press and designing and how I work with the designer and the press people to do the book. And then the end, which is a good long piece of it, is kind of the all-important crowdfunding process. Um, I ran a Kickstarter campaign and was successful. I got 110% um, of goal, this is last year, to fund this year's project. So um, that I kind of, right after the Kickstarter campaign ended, I, I wrote down this article, like top 10, and lo and behold, like every month, someone emails me, I heard you did a good Kickstarter, what do I do? And I just say, read this article, you know. So um, that I think will be helpful to you guys. Um, I guess I'll ask, quest ask open it to questions in every section, um, just to be clear. Um, so let's start. Um, a little bit about me first. So I'm a self-taught photographer. So I've been a pro photographer for about eight years. And the first question I usually get from people is like, when did you first realize you wanted to become a photographer? How did you do it? You know? um, I knew I wanted to be a photographer since I was a kid. I'd kind of dreamed about it, but it wasn't really until I um, I quit my day job um, when I was about 25 and, and traveled around the world. I ended up, I was going to go for three months and then come back, and then I was going to go for six months, and I ended up being on for two years. And as I traveled around, I found myself at first shooting a lot of landscapes. Um, I was just really interested in, in the kind of environment around me and um, things like that. And when I returned and started looking at my photos, I actually did a little mini show in a studio and it's successful. People bought them and they said, you should do it. And I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe I'll give this a try, a try. But as I continued to do it, I realized I wanted to shoot people as well, right? It's a pretty standard progression. I wanted the stories behind the landscapes. So this is some of my early kind of travel portraiture. And um, where was I? I? The third love that I have besides travel, landscape, and people, I guess, is um, music. Uh, I've, been, I've been a musician since I was a kid, my dad was a musician, and I was, was interested in photographing musicians. So I started doing some of my assignment work with photographing musicians, just my little off-kilter portraits. Um, this is a, a frame actually after the shoot ended when he was going home, and I kept shooting, and I actually showed it to him and he used it for his album cover. So first little tip is don't put the camera away until you put it away, you know? Um, uh, it's, it's often the, that non-scripted moment, right, that we're all looking after, looking for. So I feel like I got pretty good at it. Um, you know, doing some, this is in East Harlem on the streets, um, and this taught to me you don't need a, someone to actually be in the frame to be a, to make it a portrait. You know about that person even without seeing his face a little bit. Um, and I started photographing some pretty prominent musicians. This is Manu Chao. He's like this world music guy from uh, from Europe, from Spain. Uh, this is Antti Balas in the Flatiron District, and this is um, Eugene Hutz from Gogol Bordello. A lot of this was for this world magazine, Global Rhythm. Um, and this is the spread from that. Again, a portrait that doesn't show his face. Um, and that was the, what the cover was. So you know, I started getting some prominence and uh, got some images in NPR. And um, my image was selected in the Kodak website, professional website, and featured there. And they sponsored me for this project. Um, and actually, I got some photos in the New York Times. This is the Why We Travel section when it was paid. Now it's crowdsourced, unfortunately. Um, so that came about directly a result of me continuing to pitch them on Brazil work. And they said, well, we're good with Brazil right now, but send us when you keep on traveling. So what does that teach you? Persistence without being annoying, obviously. You know, sending good stuff all the time. So I was doing pretty well, and I felt like I was being successful, but I wanted to do a project that was deeper. I wanted to go to one place over and over again. Like many travel photographers parachute in a place for a week, shoot it, and then they leave, and they come, never come back. I wanted to kind of do it completely differently. So thus a flower in the mouth, right? This is the cover. Um, uh, I, I chose this area. Well, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, the Just to kind of come from a wide view, if you have not been there before, 
Pernambuco, which is the state in northeast of Brazil, is the capital is, is Recife, and it's the fifth biggest city in Brazil. So this is not a small town. Um, it's industrial. It's modern. Um, the Portuguese had made it their first Brazilian port in the 1500s, and about a century la later, the Dutch made it uh, a center of their sugar trade, so it made it to be quite cosmopolitan from an early, early time. Um, this is another view of the city. Lined by mangroves, the Capibaribi River snakes through the industrial downtown and outer neighborhoods. So while it is a modern city, there are some touches of the earlier days. So these were kind of these are some of the Im images in the intro to my book um, to show the sense of scale of like where are we coming from. You know, if you can imagine like in the movies when they start from space and they kind of zoom all the way in and in and in, in, in. This is the how I said so the eighty thousand foot view, but a little bit of detail there too. So my book is part kind of like ethnographic document, part travel journal, and part art book. Um, I call it a work of visual anthropology. And I'll talk about that a little later. But um, I'll be showing some spreads from the book, too, not just photos, to sh give you an idea of how it is all designed. This is the table of contents. And it's a good convenient time for me to say that the book was split up into three sections, carnival, culture, and ceremony. And I'll talk about that as well. Um, but it's not meant to be this like vast compendium of all things carnival. It's pretty uh, wide and pretty deep as far as the type of images there, but it's just my view. It's five visits there, and uh, uh, but I, I did create quite a large archive from the place. So let's go there, Carnival. So Carnival in Pernambuco. Now Carnival is connected to this pre-Lenten celebration. It happens in February. It's similar to Mardi Gras that happens in New Orleans. I'll hint at that a little later. Um, but it's really a colorful and folkloric an intimate thing. It's not this um, carnival in this area I found interesting compared to your stereotype of, you know, Rio when you see a lot on, on the news wires where it's in this big stadium. Um, this is very direct. You can be right on the street and see them parading right in front of you. You can join in like a second line in Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Um, uh, where was I? So it can be a large crowd in downtown Recife. Like this is a march or this is a marching of the, the dolls, the bonecas in the cobblestone streets of Olinda. And um, the first thing you probably hear musically in Hisifi is called Frevo, which is a music uh, very similar to like marching band, like Sousa, um, and it's, it's everywhere. So a lot of characters come out for Carnival. This is a character, Zebonatiu. He, he looks like Elvis, but he's actually a, ca a character from uh, the Brazilian soap opera. And this gentleman dresses up in this character every year, a different sort of manifestation of this character which is fascinating. If you think about it, or I thought about it a lot, and this, um, you know, what is masking? There's something about putting a mask on, it changes your identity. If you've ever gone to uh, a Halloween party or a mask ball, people act crazy because they remove their identity, you know? They become someone else. They sort of shuffle off their worries for the day. And uh, it's very much about transformation in Carnival. It's kind of the Carnival theory. But also, Hisifi is very well known for the Galo de Madrugada, which is the largest carnival parade in Brazil. 1.5 million people estimated go in the morning, the first morning of carnival. And that's actually shot from a helicopter, just FYI. Um, and so th the type of parades go from this huge thing all the way back down to a little bit more of an intimate thing. This is called the Omeng de Meonoiti, which is the man of, the mi of midnight. And this is actually one of the oldest uh, traditional blocos in Olinda. But it's also one of the most dangerous. It's really well known for its vicious fighting. And people said, don't go there. And as you can see, I shot it from a roof because I did not want to get involved with that with my gear. Um, it's dangerous not just because people get drunk, but it's, it's, um, it's kind of connected with that doll as one of the spirits. It's kind of like the dark spirits of Carnival. It shows a little bit of the underside of Carnival, that it's not only you know, light and, and merriment. Um, but the point is, in general, that Carnival is not just a party. I mean, people take it very seriously. Um, they prepare all year. Uh, as this is one another spread from the book, as you can start to see. Um, this this girl is is uh, putting on her makeup on a drum. She's using a drum as a as a uh, table, and you know, carnival there means different things to b different people. Some people it's just a holiday, like Christmas or whatever. You know, Christmas holidays. Uh, but to some, it's just it's a reminder of the kind of regular cycle and renewal of the year. Um, either way, it's a really a part of their life. It's sacred and it's work. You know. And the city takes it seriously, too. They kind of gussy up the city, repaint everything for the year. And um, it's, it's quite interesting to see how they take it so seriously. 
So uh, a flower in the mouth, right? Why did I choose the title? That's another question I, I get. Um, this is, and also remember the, um, the subtitle of the book is called The Beauty and the Burden of Carnival. That to me is like the light and the dark, right? But um, I chose the title of The Flower in the Mouth because it symbolizes this. This is a famous character of the country carnival called the Caboclo de Lanza. Um, now the Caboclo is one of the more recognizable characters in the carnival of the sugarcane country, right? The interior, right? So this is, these guys are the workers that, that they chew the sugarcane and they work in it every day, cutting since early morning. It's one of the hardest jobs. And um, if you notice, these guys are really strong. I'm actually gonna go backwards. They're really strong and masculine, but in a carnival, they transform, they become beautiful. In fact, I asked one of the, the main maestras, the main leaders of, the, uh, of these groups, I'm like, why do you go through all the trouble? I mean, they don't get paid, really. They get paid only enough for their expenses. Like, why do you do this every year? It's, yes, yeah, tradition, but it's a lot of work. And he said, we do it to be beautiful. We do it to be too cool because we enjoy it. And it's a really simple statement. But, you know, these, so the beauty, right, but the burden, too. I mean, these costumes are heavy. They are 90 pounds. They're huge brass bells, and they're hot. And this is the middle of summer in Brazil, tropical summer. And, you know, these costumes are, they have all, like, sequins, and they're very, very heavy. Um, and it's, it's they, they travel for four straight days, day and night, on the bus, going to town to town to perform and get a little bit of money. Also, I'm showing this image because this is part of the, the Maracatu in, in, um, in the countryside. But um, you can see here that these guys have light colored eyes. So it kind of belies a little bit of their heritage, their mixed heritage of not just African, but uh, European as well. So the flower they hold in the mouth um, symbolizes a few things. The deep connection with the land and nature because they're cane cutters and they're out in the fields all day but it also represents his purity because a caboclo de lanza is not allowed to have sexual relations um, during preparations or you know, performance of carnival. They have to be kind of pure. It gets them in the right frame of mind that they dance through the streets for days with this burden. So culture. Um, part of, you know, I first was drawn to the region by the music. I wanted to do a thing on music, but I realized in carnival, the culture is the thing that supports the, the carnival. You know, carnival is something and, that, and that's in a way how I structured the three chapters. Um, carnival is the very public thing. Culture supports that public. And then the ceremonies, which we'll, which we'll see, is a little bit more behind closed doors. So um, we're going to start, the, as far as the culture, with Madaka II. And Madaka II is a style of music and dance, processional music and dance, that's found only in the carnival in this region. There's two types. There's one in the city, and there's one in the country. The city one is called Nassau, and that means nation. And it's direct relation to the African um, uh, Nago nation, West Africa, from the slave days. And um, this I'm showing a little bit behind the scenes before you show the pageantry of someone making a drum. So like he bends the bass, it's a big, huge bass drum about this big. And he's bending the, the, the frame. And then what he does is he wets the goat, the goat skin and stretches it across. It takes him days to make one drum. And this is what the drums look like at the end. They're very handmade, they're tuned by this cordial method with, uh, with ropes and uh, they have a distinctive sound. The maker of Alfaya's told me that every drum has its own personality and has to be maintained by, this tra you know, by the traditional cordial uh, tightening method every time they take it out. So it's not just like they take it and it's ready to go. It's a process. It's work. And I put in a lot of these little interviews and kind of drop quotes throughout the book to make it not just from, not, not just my writing, but I wanted to have the voice of the people who shaped this culture. It's very important. Oh, and I'm going to go backwards. This is the uh, a spread, so you can get an idea of, gee, how did those random photos get into this? You know, what does it look like in the book? There's also a pageantry to it all. I mean, this standard bear, bear you can see how proud he is of representing the centuries of tradition. Um, uh, it's, it's a whole thing with a king and queen and a court and princes. and um, This is what it looks like when they're practicing on the streets without costumes, but it gives you an idea of their formations. And this is the gonge, which is the cowbell. And I put a little clip there for you guys to...
if you could imagine being you know in the streets and, and you know a hundred drummers around you you definitely have to wear the earplugs so it gives you an idea it's another spread from the book oh I can do this oh. um, throughout this though the queen is the most important person of the Monaco too it's actually kind of an inversion though the female is the head of this group um, not only is she a parade I'm showing the spread because she's not only parading in the regal finery as the queen, but she works every day sewing the costumes in her, in her home. And not only is she sewing and fixing the costumes for her, but for the whole group, you know, 40, 60, 80 people. Um, not, and she manages all logistics, and she's also a spiritual and community leader of the neighborhood. So this is her in the actual temple, um, which is not public. Um, so I kind of asked her, well, why do you do all this? Again, it's a similar question to the other woman, but she said, other guy, and she said, it's my obligation. You know, like I, it's not like she chooses to do. It's kind of, it's a, connect, it's a deep connection for her. Um, so I found that interesting. And so another form of carnival culture is called the caboclinos. And they um, are, have, they're like kind of in honoring their indigenous background with feathered music and dance. And they use these um, wooden arrows to clack in time with, the, the whistle and the, the bells and things like that. And this is kind of what Cabo Clinos look like. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, all of this stuff is handmade and gorgeous. Um, and this is what it sounds like. Okay, so now we're going to move to the country um, part, the cane cutting region. This is the type of carnival there. And you know, when we talked about the Cabocles de Lanza, they lead the procession, but this is the musicians um, around them. So it's called the Terno. It's, a, it's a, a circle of musicians that plays. And this is what it sounds like. So it's part of why I was fascinated. I mean, you know, we just heard three or four musical styles, all from the same area, wildly different, somewhat related, but really each one has its own universe. Um, so if you can imagine the in, in the interior, you've got those caboclos de lanza with their big lances, you've got the music, and then you have the procession. And so these, this is the kind of the regal finery in the countryside. I mean, and that's a man, by the way. You know, pretty fabulous. And these guys, so this is the Shagada, which is where they're just first coming out and they're showing all their dance skills. And you can note, oh sorry, you can note the, the, the feathers on the, on the headdress. That's also a connection to their indigenous um, kind of con um, background. So let me see, where was I? Yeah, a lot of these guys, they play around the, each town to get some money as they go. So I'm just showing that. And um, this is another one of those um, caboclos that with the, uh, with the feather headdresses. But I just show this because this is a shot I took in Mardi Gras in New Orleans. You can see a little bit the difference. This guy, uh, and then this guy, also in New Orleans. You can see a little bit of it. It's interesting to me how the traditions evolved sort of separately, parallel. So anyway, back to Brazil. These are. Um, this is another part of the procession, which they use bexigas, they're called. They're blown up cow bladders. They use them as instruments, but they also use them to beat away um, photographers who are in the way. <laughs> and they hurt. They hurt a lot. Um, yeah, the, this, is, um, this is what's called a kaitita, and it's in, usually in blackface. Um, and he's a thief and a clown and a trickster. A little bit of the comedic element of carnival in the countryside, but also a little bit of the dark side of carnival, kind of, you know, the imp. Um, and that's a, another spread from the book with those, the same type of characters. Also in the Zona de Mata, the country, uh, the country region is the Cavallo Marino, which is a mix of street theater, and musical tradition, family entertainment, and social commentary. So it usually starts at midnight and lasts till dawn, that last shot. Um, that's right when, maybe 4.30 a.m., when, when the sun's coming up. A lot of interesting characters coming through on there. 
And it's pretty a joyful uh, celebration. This is, it's not just all like dark and, and stuff. So, But yeah, there is a ritual aspect. I mean, this performer is pressing his glass, his face in ground glass at the height of the show to get some tips. And the Monica 2 practices leading up to carnival are events themselves, usually held at sugarcane uh, plantations. It's a chance to see kind of the performers without their heavy costumes, but to see their moves. I'm going to plug in again for a second here. Because. So again, a, another wildly different style of music. And that's all in the sugarcane plantation. So the plantation is obviously fields, but that's the area in which all the houses are and where they process things. So ceremony this is the third section. Um, so as I kept returning to this region, I, kept, I went five times over nine years. Um, and as I showed my work and people saw me come back and, uh, over and again, I was eventually invited to some private ceremonies providing kind of a glimpse of the other side of Carnival. Um, one ceremony is called a limpeza, which means a cleaning. And this is the head of the ceremony. This is called a yalorisha. Um, she's like kind of the interpreter of the, of the spirits. And this is her posing in studio, actually, for me. Um, the ceremony called limpeza is using eggs. And what they do is, um, you know, those who are getting clean, so it's going get to them, get them ready for carnival before, right? Those who are getting clean, they blow on the eggs a certain time, and then they offer the eggs to Eshu, which is the, the, the uh, protector deity of this whole. Did I? OK, yeah. I mean, in other ceremonies that I went to, participants smoked ritual tobacco as a way to communicate with the spirits. And again, I'll just go back. That's a man, just FYI. Um, and in about an hour's drive from Hasifi. So this is exactly the example. I was showing my work, and someone's like, oh, come back next Saturday. And then he, he took me all the way in. I would never have been able to find that. Um, so let me see. I might just plug in again here. So in here, again, there's a transformation. This is a woman, and she's dressed as a man. And so what they do is, the woman becomes a man and leads the cross-dressing man to proceed in the room swirling and dancing. We'll see. So in many of these places of worship, a shrine can dominate the whole building or just be tucked away in a side closet or hidden alcove. Um, I found them fascinating because it's a real mix of you've got African, you've got Christian, you've got you know Elvis down there, I think. You've got all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I, and I could shoot this all day, all, all the time. There's so many shrines and symbols, which kind of brings us back to that. Um, you know, the people in Hasifi, they have a real affinity to symbols and street art. And, and Hisifi, the city, has a real gritty feel. I mean, it's not uh, this tourist paradise of palm trees and beaches. It's, it, there is that around the city, but in the actual city, it's pretty gritty. Um, they also love their kind of quirky symbolism. You know, this is like a vendor you know, of hot dogs. Kashoho Kint. So this is kind of just like a glimpse of some of the depth of culture in Pernambuco. I focus on carnival, but the other times of carnival, uh, outside of carnival, the other nine months of the year, um, they have all sorts of different music. They have samba, they have afouché, they have faho, which is very becoming very popular here in New York and all around the world. Um, there's also a new movement in the past couple of decades called monkey beats from this area, where young musicians like this guy, Junior Black, um, they're mixing traditional rhythms with contemporary music like rock or whatever, or cumbia or, or hip hop and collaborating with these masters to create something new. It's kind of revitalizing the traditional music in that area. Um, and as this grows in popularity, oh, I'll, I'll just keep on. This is uh, Claudio Habeca. He's holding a Habeca, which is a, a fiddle from uh, Pernambuco that's made from wood only from that area, only in that state. 
um, but it's a traditional music that he's using in rock. Uh, yet another traditional musician guy who's um, sort of cross border. He's 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 the board, he's the bridge, excuse me, between the traditional music, the guy who's dancing with, and the modern. Oops. And that's Siba, and oh, I don't think I actually have one. And he's a modern musician. He started as a rocker, as like a heavy metal rocker, and he started collaborating with these guys, like the the traditional musicians who I shot in black and white. Um, to, and now he's, uh, you know, he started from his Sifi, but now he's a sort of bigger rocker in Sao Paulo. Let me see here. I put this slide in here too because it's, as the, the music is growing in popularity with, um, with contemporaries, the government and also ad agencies and companies are using the imagery of Carnival to market the region, to market themselves. This is Teacher's Whiskey. Um, and they're using, see this thing, this, um, this is a carnival sequin, and they're using that as part of their branding, which I actually kind of find that pretty funny. Um, the other trend is that foreign musicians, this guy Scott Kettner, who I'll talk about in a little bit, um, they're starting to come to the region and learn the music and then take it back home and, and transform it there and, and teach people here and make their own music from it. So all of this, you know, I realized this work helped to develop my, my development as a photographer and the work influenced what I loved, I, I realized I loved to shoot, which is culture, and culture that's an intimate part of a society. So again, it's vig visual anthropology. And just a couple more images here. The first question I usually get is why this place? Why do you keep going back and why Brazil? You know? So a little bit of the history of it. I, I wanted to do a project documenting traditional musicians and everyone was telling me to check out Brazil. Before I went the first time, I did a bunch of research. I first talked to anyone who'd been to the country, um, anyone, any musician from Brazil, and then I started talking with ethnomusicologists, very specific. Um, and they kept saying, yeah, you can go to Rio, which is very well known, you can go to Salvador, which is well, very well known, but consider going to a place that's barely known outside of Brazil. Um, and that's kind of how I got there. The first time I went there, I went off season. So I went in like October, and I started working with two Monica two groups, one in the country and one in the city, and just to get to know them. And then they and I did some shooting, but they said you got to come back for Carnival. So I went back that next Carnival, and uh, I'll tell you that um, going there beforehand really helped. But I, you know, I arrived maybe a week or two before Carnival. But during Carnival, I didn't sleep for four days, days and night, day and night. There's so much going on. Um, as I got to know Carnival, I got to know what I wanted to do. I got more focused with it. But um, as I kept on returning to the region, I was able to pitch um, different magazines. And I started getting assignments from Global Rhythm. I got an assignment from AP, from Associated Press. Um, and I, I mentioned some other stuff. But basically, a lot of it was because I was able to show sort of atypical images from the region. I'm not your you know, scantily clad um, dancer or soccer or beach, everything, stereotypes that you think of Brazil. Um, that's kind of part of my angle. This is the article from a Global Rhythm that I wrote. So it also made me write about it and made me think about what's the story arc there and how do you organize and wait a minute, where do you stay and where do you eat and, you know, things like that. As what connecting with the ethnomusicologists, um, one invited me to join his book and I, the photo of mine is on the cover. This is Oxford University Press. So as I you know, kept on working it, I got known in the, the areas for having this archive of photos. Um, I also had uh, some success, success. I had some exhibits. One exhibit was in the Brazilian consulate. And one person who attended that consulate exhibit in New York um, worked for Putumaya Records. So then he contacted me saying, we're doing a compilation on mus Brazilian music. Do you want to join? And it was, for me, it was pretty amazing because usually, if you know Putumaya, it's usually um, hand-drawn things on the cover. And does, rarely do they include photos in the liner notes. And, you know, 5,000 CDs, pretty good. A Harvard magazine, that sort of thing. Um, United Nations actually invited me to, to submit some images for a slideshow they did because they had a big uh, summit in Rio in 2010. And Lincoln Center. So um, a couple months ago, the end of the summer, Lincoln Center had a pretty historic um, performance in which is the first time the Monica II that we saw with the Queen and the big drums ever played in the United States. So they invited me for a solo exhibit um, to supplement the performance. 
And I said, okay, that's when I'm going to launch my book, um, which we'll talk about the, uh, the production in a minute. Another important connection as I built it, oh, that was the, uh, that was the launch. That's to get an idea of the scale of it. And I did a little presentation similar to this. Uh, Scott Kettner was the musician who I made a connection with right away. Um, and he was important throughout this whole project. So it's a way I collaborated with him. As I brought back images from every trip I did, he used them for his presentations, or he, he put some in his book um, for his website. And then he hired me to shoot his band a couple times, because I knew I got an idea of his style, what he wanted. Maybe in studio, that's a pretty new shot. And one of the awards in my Kickstarter was called the Encontro, which is a musical party at the end. And he played on it, and this is what it looked like. I projected my images behind him. So we really collaborated in, in a bunch of different ways. And of course, he helped me with the Lincoln Center opening. Um, so let me see, about the book specifically, um, production. All right, I'm, I'm going to production now. So to produce the book, um, the photography side aside, I decided to write a manuscript. I decided to write the book as well because it ended up being about 10,000 words of writing. And this was not a light decision because I felt the traditional photo book would not really do it justice. It would not be true to diversity of culture and the ceremonies there. Um, I guess to put it another way, my images, when I showed them to people, they wanted to know more, right? That's good, right? But I also had all the text translated to Portuguese, so the book would connect with Brazilians both here and abroad. But like this image is um, sort of, to me, indicative of like why I did so much writing. Because everyone would ask, well, what does that mean? Just an image by itself, it's great. And that was the, where they wrote the names of their relatives that they want the gods to um, look over them during the Limpeza when they break it open and they show. So um, again, it's like, what does this shrine mean? What god is it? When do they use it? You know, that kind of thing. And then this image, too, it's not just necessarily what does it mean, but um, to me, this is really interesting. This is the epitome of what it means to be um, a drummer in this area. You know, they're waiting to perform, and it's like 4 in the morning, and it's during a, a, um, a competition, I guess. They're supposed to play at 4, but they're delayed, so they're just waiting, and they're sleeping. They've been playing for three days straight. So I remember showing this to some people, and they say, yeah, that's my experience. It's not... It's not necessarily the, I'm on stage and it's great, but this is the underbelly, the kind of like the behind the scenes of it. So uh, I think I missed something here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think before I go that, the translation itself, I don't know if I have that, but I did have all the text translated to Portuguese for a couple of reasons. One, so the book would connect with the Brazilians both here and abro abroad, um, but also so um, more people could be because there's a lot of uh, Brazilians who don't speak English, both here and there, surprisingly. Um, and the translation from a production standpoint represents a challenge. You know, Traditionally, the translation's in the back of the book, but I didn't feel like I wanted it. It didn't feel like it was giving it enough justice to the actual text. It would seem like Portuguese was the second language, like a you know, secondary language. So I put it alongside on it in, um, in kind of offset in two columns in gray color and black. Um, and I could show you. But I chose the printing company Friesen's in Canada um, because I had pretty tight deadlines. I heard about the exhibit in April and I needed it for July. So China is out. Italy is out because they take much longer. Um, but they had amazing production quality. And I went on press to ensure everything the first time doing it. I recommend it to anyone doing it. Um, and so I thought, OK, let's show what the press looks like. And what, do we, what is it? CMYK, right? So cyan, magenta yellow and black, these big vats feed into this, these great big huge machines, which are amazingly calibrated. Um, and that's what the book likes coming through, so the color and the black and white separations. Where is this? That's in Canada. Can yeah. you say you went on press and you like the I went to the plant. I was right there. Right. Um, that's my press guy. There's many like him, but he was mine. Right. Um, uh, you know, he was pretty amazing because I, I would recommend also, he, I, I think he was very experienced, but if you ever do go on press and they're talking to you about numbers and data, just say, I want to tell you photographically what I want. You know, I want less blue or more contrast, and they'll do it. Because it's very tricky for being on press. Oh, I think that might be time. I can actually show you what one um, sheet looks like. 
Um, they come out on sheets, double sided, and um, yeah. But if you want to change one photo, you 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 it's basically in zones. If you want to add three points yellow, it's going to add it for the whole strip, All right? But they have ways to manipulate it that way. So okay, add three yellow, but take away you know three magenta or whatever it is. Um, but I found it fascinating. I can leave that out. You can all look at it afterwards. Did you do that each picture then? Each 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 sheet we looked at, and I had to sign off. They had little stamps. Wait a minute. Actually, you know what? Might as well show it. So um, that was about a day and a half or two days of just every hour they call you. And you have to be right there. You're not doing anything else. And that's what a signature looks like. Someone says signature. Yeah. And that's what the photos look like when they're, I mean, the, the sheets look like all stacked up. It's interesting for me to see the process, and I figured I would show it because not many people have done it. And so this is yet another spread. Um, I guess I'm talking a little bit about how, oh, when I'm talking with the designer. So how do you translate your vision? You know, I, I went over nine years and five visits to someone who's never seen, never met you before, never project before. Yes, I showed the photos, but I wanted to communicate to her kind of the vibe, I guess, of how I wanted to show the book. And it, it was kind of um, a mix between elegant, like an elegant white space art book, but also a little mm. bit of grittiness. If you can see the typeface of, of the drop quotes, they're a little bit, um, well, gritty, I guess. So I use some stuff like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Blues DVD. Uh, they were directed by Martin Scorsese. And the intro of the Blues DVDs, they're really gritty feels, that really um, kind of time-worn feel. And I played a few DVDs for her saying, that, that's what, I don't want that exactly, but that's the kind of feeling. I also um, scanned and showed her some of the programs from the, from the carnival there to give an idea that's the kind of like whimsical, you know, kind of colorful, magical thing that they kind of had going on there. Um, I also showed her, this is in the book, but I showed it to her mostly because this is representative of the, the street art, the kind of like the very folky kind of vibe. And, but it is bright color, and those are the colors of Pernambuco, yellow, green, blue, and red. And it's so bright and so vibrant. So we kind of made the decision in the book production to make the rest of it, you know, pretty um, laid back. I mean, it doesn't have to, the design itself doesn't need to be hitting you over the head because the images are so saturated. But yet, we'll do some spreads without text and some spreads with. And just I'm showing this because this is a real classic example of the rigorous sort of hierarchy of title, body copy, caption copy. You know, and the title is in block blue, and the captions are in block blue. And that makes a good designer who is really, really watching for those type issues. We also did something, I show this because not only the translation, see on the left hand side is the English, and the right hand side is the Portuguese. But um, this is a, with the blue background, we call it a sidebar. So it's kind of a story within a story, within a section. So I did that for very specific times when I wanted to kind of, well, a sidebar is like kind of getting away from, from the actual main thrust of the story, but still important to the book. And yes, I did some spreads with um, full page, you know, full bleed. So the last element that I did was in the chapter heads. I had three chapters, and I wanted to make nice breaks between them. Um, and I felt like it was so colorful work, I wanted the breaks to be sort of monochromatic. So we took these images. This is an image, a detail image of sequins. And we made it to be a duotone, such that it was a blue duotone. And then that's the intro of a carnival, right? So then you see this, this image of the, um, the things that they sell in the ceremonial shops in the, in the market. And that's for ceremony. So just to give you an idea of kind of like, I wanted it to, to be both um, this kind of time-worn feeling of the, the Blues DVD, but also a little bit of a break from the color saturation. So it took a while. It took a while to get, you know, how do you look at an archive of 30,000 images over shot over <coughs> nine years and five visits, right? Um, and yeah, I shot it all, but did I have it all in mind, you know, this theme? Uh, no, but Flower in the Mouth started. It took over a long time of... Um, brainstorming and listing and what what should I say and I had three or four other working titles how do you make it 
Um, and I put this slide in because it's, first of all, the back cover. Right there. And now, why is it not the front cover? Or why is it not the, the first caboclo with the front cover? Because, I don't know, it's a little obvious. Wanted to make it a little bit mysterious. That was my choice, you know. Um, a lot of these images, as we as we looked through, you know, we started to be there started to be more themes, and I workshopped a lot with a lot of people who who knew this stuff or didn't know it, even people who just have a good visual sense. I started to realize that it was really about a democratic carnival. That wasn't really this. It was a it was an intimate you know thing where people are on the streets and. There are some stereotypical images, maybe like this, Brazilian soccer, but you're still not quite sure what's happening because it's carnival and there's white gloves and there's no face, so it's a little bit of a mystery. So okay, so now we're going to move to crowdsourcing. Here's the area where um, I think a lot of people were kind of waiting, which was like the Kickstarter crowdsourcing part, right? So this was the end page of it. Um, uh, where was I? You know, I thought it might be helpful. I'm going to plug this in again because we're going to watch some video. Now that we've seen some images, right, all, a lot of images, um, I thought it might be helpful, like, OK, how do you tell the story with a video? Because can Kickstarter, you need to have a video, right? So let's see. Oi, me no me, Jason Gardner. Hi, I'm Jason Gardner. When I first visited Pernambuco in the northeast of Brazil, I was immediately captivated by the extraordinary music and traditions. Over the past nine years, I've returned again and again to document this vibrant and lesser known culture. I didn't just photograph the public festivities of Carnival. Anyone can do that. Because I kept on returning to the region, I was invited to the private rituals, the ones that happen behind the closed doors, ones that show the other side of Carnival. I'd like to share my vision of this special place, often overlooked by travelers to Brazil, through a book containing photographs and texts. The texts will contain interviews of the people who shape this dynamic culture and writing from my own experiences. I've already worked with a designer to determine the look and the seal of the book. I'd like to publish this book and distribute it throughout the United States, Europe, and Brazil. Please share this project with any friends who are interested in Brazilian music and culture. Your support will make this initial print run possible. For me, Carnival is so special here because it's an intimate event for everybody. While there are big acts and local traditional groups performing on stages placed throughout the city, I think the true magic happens on the streets. Musical groups parade in the narrow cobblestone streets of Olinda. Everyone shows off their feather and sequin costumes they've been preparing all year. The mysterious Caboclos de Lanza roam the country towns, swirling their lances and clanging their bells and the booming drums of the Maracatu Nassau resonate off the urban neighborhoods. Sometimes I got so into it that I couldn't resist joining the fun. I've had some success with this project. I've had exhibits at the Brazilian consulate in New York and San Francisco. The intimacy. This is such a complete presentation. He, he spent time documenting every aspect of the, the musicians and the artists and the celebratory nature of, of the events, and, I, and that just that comes through so vividly. Please click on that little green button to donate for a flower in the mouth, showing the beauty and the burden of Carnival in Pernambuco, Brazil. Thank you very much. I could not do it without you. Okay. So before I go on, what, what, can we, what have we learned from this video, right? Now that you, you have my whole backstory and all the stuff. So I actually wrote some notes. So I didn't have it in my presentation. But um, number one, you show a project as complete as possible, right? You don't just say, oh, I have this idea. Give me money to do it. You know, I said I had a designer. I shot it already. It's just ready to go. Another one is to put yourself in it. Don't just disembodied voice. People want to connect directly with an artist, right? So I put a little humor. Yeah, they put my beard green. It's all great. But you know, e even at the beginning, maybe I'll just go to this. OK, all right, whatever. Um, oh, that's not good. Sorry. Um, even at the beginning, I said, hi, I'm Jason, right? And I did this, the captions just for um, because a lot of Brazilians don't understand English yet. So um, 
put a direct ask on there at the end. Please donate, you know, instead of just like, oh, here's my project, thanks. Or I also said, please share that with friends who are interested in culture, right? Um, and then uh, the, the, I put the thing in from the Brazilian consulate because it had another person's testimonial. It wasn't just me saying how great I am, it was someone else saying how great I am. So these are things that I think could be potentially consistent for all of your guys' projects too. Um, okay, so let me see. A few other screenshots from the Kickstarter back end, and I'm going to go into my top 10 tips for Kickstarter, which is that article that I send out. So uh, note that the, of the traffic itself, of the donations, there was a good chunk that came from Kickstarter. And where does that come from? It comes from people randomly going on the Kickstarter site and searching <coughs> for me or Brazil. But there's a lot of times in which I, I found there's a couple people who are just like serial Kickstarter donors, and they just find cool projects. Um, and then there was one time in which I was featured on the page, like a hot project or something in Brooklyn. I was hot, so I got some traffic there. That was just kind of <coughs> interesting. And the average pledge amount, seventy dollars. So um, this is not a great graph, sorry. But um, I basically set up twenty-five dollars as an ebook and sixty-five as the hard copy, and those were the two most popular um, sections. And then I have some more popular, which were the prints version, which were higher. Um, so crowdfunding top 10, here we go. Um, plan ahead, right, number one. It's all about timing. Um, Kickstarter campaigns are recommended to be 30 days. You can do them less, you can do them more. I would not recommend more because you'll burn out and everyone will be burned out. Um, and when I say Kickstarter, I'm being a little generic. There's plenty of crowdsourcing platforms now. Um, at the time, there weren't as any strong. There's some pros and cons to Kickstarter. The whole like, do I, you know, it's all or nothing, or do I do keep or you collect? You can go either way. There's, I, I, I'm not advocating either one. I'm just saying it as a short form Kickstarter. So it's a 30 day campaign, what I chose, but I, I worked about 30 or 45 days before that to plan not just the video and the page, but I would recommend um, getting what's called surrogates in advance. So like get a team of people who know and like you really well and know your project and will send out the message for you. Um, have at least one in-person event, ideally in the middle of the campaign when it's slowest. There's kind of a trough effect, right? The beginning of the campaign, it's all, it's all sexy and all great and very lot of traffic. And at the end, part of the benefit of the all or nothing model is that you know, if you're only at 80% of goal, people are motivated to help you to get that goal, right? But in the middle, it's a little bit quiet. So I would recommend planning an in-person event in the middle. Um, and uh, I would plan, if you can, a soft launch and a hard launch, right? So maybe make a 35-day campaign and do a little soft launch for five days, meaning it's live, but you don't tell the world about it. You just tell about your small core about it. Get a little bit of money in there. Because the idea is when you hard launch, if you have five or even 10% funded, then there's a feeling of, oh, it's going already. There's momentum. You know, people want to join in a party. They don't want to come to a party where there's no one there. You don't want to go in a restaurant where there's no one eating, right? It's the same idea. Um, and w you have to tell them why you're pre-asking your, your sort of core people. Like, I, I need to show that it's good. And also, Kickstarter says that once you get to 30% chance, I'm sorry, once you get to 30% goal, you have a higher chance of getting the actual goal. So the sooner you can get there, the better. Um, structure, ooh, yeah, set up your page, wi set up your page wisely. Um, that means be realistic with your dollar goal. Don't overshoot because uh, you can't change it in the middle of a campaign. Um, be realistic with costs. I had one photographer I know who said, you know what, I don't want to succeed in my campaign because I'll lose money because she didn't price her awards appropriately. She, missed, she underestimated the costs. Um, maybe consider keeping one or two awards back for a later release or limited edition. Um, don't give them too many choices. I would space your awards allow, allow. Don't do 5, 10, 15, 20 dollars to 5, 25, 50, 100, 200 dollars. You know, so people don't have too, that's maybe even too much. Um, and then you want to think about why would someone help you? They would help you because they're a friend or you're a contact. They'd help you because they're interested in the cause, or the subject matter of your project. Or they're interested just because they want the award. So those are kind of the three major categories of and you want to think about what you're speaking to when you, when you have put your page up. It's important to sit down and rate your network, your whole contact list, everyone you know, everyone you don't know, everyone who's in your address book. 
Um, I use one to five. One being, I don't know who they are, they don't know who I am, but they're somewhere in my list. And five being my best friend, you know? Um, and you wanna, this helps to form your contact strategy, you know? I don't really wanna ask my ones every week for this, but I wanna kind of focus on my fives, right? Um, remember that even your close friends will need to be up, like sort of reminded about this, because they're, they're busy too. <coughs> But communication is the key to this campaign, right? You want to standardize it a little bit, but also personalize it. A little message to each person if you can. Um, standardize the tracking at least. Maybe use a spreadsheet if you're comfortable. Um, at least the minimum, take them off the ask list once they've donated, right? Sounds obvious, but don't, you know, I've gotten some emails after I've donated, like, please donate. I just did. Um, where was I? But don't be afraid to ask and keep asking and keep asking until they tell you to stop because that's part of the game. If they don't, if people don't, if you feel like they're ones, they don't know you too well, maybe just ask them to share it. And maybe they'll be inspired to donate. Um, I've also just timing wise, I've found Sundays, Sunday nights are pretty good to send out emails because people are back from their weekend and kind of getting ready for the week. Um, and you may want to consider potentially outsourcing the sort of lower tier bulk ask you know, so you're not doing everything. Hire an assistant for 20 bucks an hour or whatever it is. Just say, send these 100 emails, go. So you don't have to deal with it. Um, but for sure, build your team. You know, the videographer, if you can't do the video, uh, script writer, advisors, both visual advisors and people with common sense. Like, does this make sense? What doesn't make sense? How can I make it make sense? Um, advisors. And part of your team are those surrogates that I mentioned that might help you, but affinity groups, groups that have an affinity to either your subject or you or, or Kickstarter, and friends, you know, you want to, the more people you can have on your team spreading the words, the less you have to do it. Um, identif ident identify affinity groups. So I call affinity groups are ones who are either interested in, or they're affinity groups with you with contacts, your contacts, or affinity groups with the subject matter. Like for me, uh, an affinity group for me was ASMP. They're a group of photographers, and so I was able to have them blast out my Kickstarter campaign on my behalf. My university alumni network has an email uh, bulletin that, sa that says what universities, uh, what alumni are doing. So they were kind enough to add it to that, that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, church groups, um, uh, my squash team, um, you know, book club, I mean, whatever it is that, that you can have people send out on your behalf is very helpful. Um, and there's affinity groups to the subject matter. If your photo book is on squirrels, then maybe there's a squirrel lovers, you know, group of America that would be happy to send it to their 10,000 members. I don't know. You have to be creative and connecting um, basically, you know, your art with the audience. So. Definitely don't be afraid, use social media. Oh, wait a second, and with the, uh, right, but one other thing, just before I forget, because I had that on there, be as specific as you can. Don't fall down a trap of, say, of saying, send it to everyone you know, because no one will ever do that. Send it to three friends, send it to three friends who know culture, send it to five friends who've ever been to Brazil. You know, the more specific you're asked, the more success possibility. So, I would also, for these surrogates and affinity groups, I would make it easy for them. Write up five or 10 pieces of content for them to send out. Don't have them, in, in a sense, what's called ghost writing, right? Don't have them make it up for you. Have some pre-cooked pre uh, information about your project that they can just go forward, right? Um, but use social media, don't be afraid. Create a Facebook event for the Kickstarter campaign. That way a lot of people can invite their friends and it's kind of cool. Um, there's a, I mean, there's a JavaScript that you can invite everyone on your contact book without having to click on every little box. It's a little tricky, but uh, if you have a lot of contacts, it's helpful. Um, and keep on posting. You want to think, this is part of the planning process, you know, think about all the content around your project. Not just, here. yeah, maybe five photos. I, sp I, I decided, okay, 30 days, I'm posting 30 pieces of content, one every day. That was my decision, so, geez, what am I going to do? Well, I had, I had 30 images, but I decided to post some spreads. I did some behind the scenes stuff. I did um, articles. I did articles on the subject matter, not of Carnival, not necessarily about my project, but anything that was related. 
Um, so you may want to think about content that you also want to give to your surrogates. You don't want to always be saying, donate, 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 donate for 30 posts. That's overkill. You kind of want to say, here's a, here's a sneak preek of, of, the, of the table of contents. What do you think? Oh, we like it. Oh, and oh, by the way, here's the link if you want to, you know, that kind of thing. Um, let me see. And I found in general for Facebook, at least, photos are much more valuable than just a, a text link or a forward or a, or a URL because um, uh, that's just how, how it is. Also, ask your surrogates and friends and stuff to comment on your posts. When it comments on the post, it raises the Facebook rank. Much, it's much more relevant instead of just liking it. It's a little secret. Um, and then if they comment, you comment back, thanks, or because that also raises the, the link. And more people see it, and more friends of friends see it, and all that good stuff. But nothing takes the place of personal asks. Um, if you're doing a campaign, be prepared for 30 days. That is your job. I mean, we all have different situations. We do stuff for our projects, for, for hobbies and such. But um, you have to budget time for personal asks. And whether those personal asks are via phone, text, get everyone together at the pub for a beer, whatever it is, um, you have to do that because that's the most effective. Um, I sometimes found text messages are good. Sometimes I just sat down and made 10 calls in an hour or whatever. Um, you'll be surprised by who helps you, and you'll be surprised by who doesn't, frankly. Um, <laughs> um, don't be afraid to ask until I tell you to stop. But, and I also suggest use the word support, not donate. It's a nuance, but it's very important. Um, ask random people on the fringe of your network. Ask the person online at the supermarket. doesn't matter. You know, the, the beauty of Kickstarter or these platforms is that it does provide you a platform to put your cup out and say, hey, you know, so I'm putting myself out there and, and please help. Update everyone, right? So you blast the hell out of the milestones. Hey, I'm at 20% or I'm at this amount of dollars. And people respond to specificity. Hey, specificity. Hey, we need to get, you know, 25% by the end of the day tomorrow. Can we do it? Will you help me? You know, they really respond for that. It's the same thing. It's like if I said, tell me a good restaurant within a five block radius. Then you'd be like, oh, I don't know. Or if I said, I want a Chinese place two blocks away that serves good chow mein, then you might be able to help me more. Um, consider, you know, uh, where was I? Update your current backers. You know, they're your best targets to refer friends. They've just backed you. So you want to keep on updating them how it's going and asking them to, to send the link on onwards. Maybe even consider someone like a mystery donor to match the funds. If we don't, if we get three thousand more by next Sunday, I've got a mystery donor who's ready to put it in. You know that kind of thing. Um, post donation strategy: email them within a few days to say thank you. Post on social media if relevant to tag them and say, "Hey, John Smith just donated. Won't you?" You know that kind of thing. I did every few days. I did a whole long list. You know, here's the ten people that donated. Thank you. You know. Um, Remember, in general, like I mentioned, crowdsourcing, this whole thing, it's allowing the audience to have a direct connection with how a project is produced. Right? It's sort of groundbreaking in that way. Yes, it's a way to raise funds, all that, but it gives you a direct connection to them. So, don't, so use that connection and keep on nurturing the connection. Um, I had a photographer, a friend of mine, who had a decent campaign, but he was like at 60% or whatever. And he couldn't, he had no new donations coming in. So I said, okay, why don't you just ask everyone who's already donated to kick it up a notch? And they did. He got to 85 and he went over the top. So, you know, success is kind of matching your art with the audience and who's apt to be in love with the project. But um, the whole point of what makes Kickstarter and a lot of this successful is that it is connecting the public with your artistic dream, passion project. Um, last thing is escape, relax. Netflix, a good meal. Don't check the thing every hour. I made that mistake. I drove myself crazy. Um, my parents who were in the audience, they called me every day. Hey, we're at 38%. This is great. Oh, God. Uh, but if you do want to check it a lot, um, Kick Mobile is a cool thing. If you, have, um, if you have colleagues or other people who are doing Kickstarter campaigns like you, you want to see how you're doing. Or Kick Track is also quite good. It, it gives you up-to-date trending scenarios for your campaign specifically. 
So you'll get an idea if you're on track or if you're kind of a little behind or whatever it is. Um, so let me see. About the book itself, um, it's 128 pages, I mentioned, color and black and white. And it actually also includes an audio um, companion to it, because I wanted to put music, the music from the region, in the book. So what I did was I put a little um, download card in there. And I licensed nine tracks from the, the musicians from there. So as a way a little bit to help them, too, to, so they get a different audience. Um, and other publishing to-dos, when you think about when you're making a book, you know, you need to get permissions from people. Um, did I have that on there? Yes. So that's just a sample of kind of with the photos that are, they're in the book and then their permission in Portuguese. You know, okay, so you don't have to do that for a lot of your projects. But um, whenever you're shooting in public, right, it's fine. But when in their private, in their homes, it's helpful to get permission. Maybe they're not going to sue me, but it's also nice because they were involved in the project. It was a little bit more to have my subjects be part of it and be informed, right? Um, other publishing to-dos, um, get an ISBN number, Libra Library of Congress number. ISBN is good for bookstores. Library of Congress is good for, I plan to sell this to universities and things like that, and they need those numbers to be in their system. Um, and set your pricing. I mean, this is a long way, day off the, a long way down the road, but figuring out your costs. Um, I set the pricing of this book at $45, which is pretty reasonable because, oops, sorry, because um, you know, you have the download card and it's a full color process and a very limited run. I didn't make thousands and thousands of them. We've got about a half an hour left, roughly, which I'd like to dedicate to last questions and signing. And you can feel, free, we'll turn the lights on, you can see the book and mm -hmm. rifle through it and all that stuff. Um, and feel free to grab, there are postcards and my cards and thanks. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.